Track 26. We are all familiar with the nuclear family, which has been the dominant family structure in the UK for the last 60 years at least. However, recent changes show that our idea of the traditional nuclear family as the cornerstone of British family life is changing. There have been emerging patterns which are eroding this structure, namely the rise of step families, cohabitation, lone parenting and the rapid increase in those living alone. We are going to explore these areas in turn and look at their effect in terms of the family. Firstly, step families are becoming more and more common. Step families are created when one or both partners have a child or children from a previous relationship. In 1980, the percentage of children under 13 who were living with one parent and their new partner was just 4%. In 2008, this figure had increased to 20%. The USA has seen an even greater rise. New statistics show that almost half of under-13s are living in a step-family. Now, we can still call the step-family structure a nuclear family, as it does follow the structure of two parents and dependent children. However, it also creates somewhat of a nuclear blur. Step-brothers and sisters may belong to two family units, so where do we draw the line at which family they belong to? Cohabitation, when partners do not marry yet live together as a family, has also increased. In 2006, of the 17.5 million families in Britain, nearly 3 million of these comprised unmarried couples. What does this mean to the nuclear family? Firstly, the traditional view of a nuclear family requires married parents, so we can't put these types of family under this umbrella. Statistics show that even if cohabiting couples have children, they are more likely to separate than their married equivalents. Lastly, we need to look at the rise of the DINCS, which stands for Dual Income, No Kids. As Clark and Henwood outline, many cohabiting couples are choosing a life without children, putting consumer spending first. Lone parenting is a relatively recent family structure, which has rapidly grown in the last half century. In 1972, only one in 14 children lived in a lone parent family. When we compare this with today's figure of one in four, we can see that this is a rapid increase. In the past, lone parenthood was overwhelmingly the result of a death of a parent. Nowadays, however, it is increasingly a choice. Some sociologists argue that this increase is due to the outlook of women. Where women once were willing to accept an unhappy or abusive marriage, now many will choose lone parenthood. Often, this can be just a transitory phase before they find a new partner. This view of women's attitudes and lone parenting is highly debated because some figures show that the largest group of lone parents are mothers who have never married. You can find counter-arguments for these ideas in Butler and Jones. One difficulty for single parents is that they are a social group who are much more likely to suffer from poverty and hardship. They are more likely to live in rented accommodation and have childcare issues. Lastly, an increasing number of people are choosing to live alone. The number of people living alone in Britain has more than doubled in the last 20 years. In 1990, just over 4 million people lived alone. Now this figure has reached 8.5 million, an incredibly rapid growth which has had enormous effects on the traditional nuclear family. This number represents a great chunk of the population who either by choice or necessity are outside the traditional family unit. Some think that these changes may not help the community. In fact, there are many arguments that this rise in alternative household structures will create a more isolationist and less community-based society, where close bonds, which are usually formed within the family, have no place. Leaving aside whether or not the housing even exists for this boom, an important factor which must be looked at is the disproportionate expense for those living on their own. 
By this, I mean the burden of all costs is shouldered by one wage instead of two, and of course, one person is using the energy which could be shared between a group, having a greater impact on the environment too. However, on a more positive note, people, especially women, are proving to be extremely... Track 27 Hi, Dad. How are you? I'm fine, Sally. How's the course going? It's going well, actually. I'm really enjoying my math course at the moment, mainly because it's not that difficult compared to the other modules. Good. And what about the tutors? What are they like? Well, I've got four, and they're all highly knowledgeable. But Professor Jones is my favorite. I really respond well to the way he teaches. And are your fellow students nice, too? Yes. I've made lots of new friends, and everyone seems to be very hardworking. The course has lots of group work, but to be honest, this isn't really the way I like to study. I prefer to study alone. Oh, well, I suppose not everything can be perfect. I know, Dad. You're right. In fact, there is one thing I'm a bit concerned about. My statistics module. I think I might not pass it. Well, let's wait and see, shall we? There's plenty of time to improve. Don't worry about it yet, okay? Thanks, Dad. I'll try not to. Track 29 Hi, Jane. How are you settling into life at university? Fine, except I don't really know what there is to do in town. I haven't had time to look around yet. You've been here for a year. Could you give me some ideas? Of course. There's lots of places for students. Firstly, if you go across the bridge over the river outside the campus and turn left... Oh, no, sorry. That's the garage. Turn right... Then you'll get to the bowling alley, which is really popular at the weekends because it's so close to the campus. On Friday nights, they have a special discount for students. Oh, that's great. I love bowling. So, do you like sports, Jane? Yes. I go running and swimming, and I play badminton. In that case, there's a running track behind the university campus, and I think they have a badminton court at the sports centre. Actually, I'm happy just to run in the park. Well, there's a large park in town, too. If you go down the road opposite the bowling alley and take the first right, then you'll get to the park. It's quite big, and there's a lake in it. You can take a boat out on it. The university rowing team practice there. What about places to eat out? Are there any good student hangouts? Absolutely. There's the Elm Tree Cafe, which is down the road from the post office, in the opposite direction from the river. The cafe is on a fork in the main road, and it's quite an institution round here. OK. Well, I'll have to check it out. I'm looking for a part-time job, so maybe I'll be able to find work there. Hmm. You should try. They're always looking for new staff, and they often hire students. Now, have I forgotten any other important places? Oh, yes. You like sport, so I should mention the leisure centre. Don't get it confused with the swimming baths, which are down the road from the supermarket. The leisure centre is opposite. There aren't any swimming baths there, but you can get a student leisure card, which will let you into both. So, you see, there is quite a lot to do in this town. It seems like there is. Well, thanks for all the information, Sophie. No problem. See you soon. Track 31 Hello. Have you come to enrol for your course or pay your fees? Um, both actually. OK, that's fine. You can enrol here with me and then go to the next desk for fee payment. So, first of all, can I have your name? Yes, it's Peter Taylor. That's Taylor with a Y. So, it's T-A-Y-L-O-R. That's right. Do you need my middle name? No, just your first and last names, thanks. And what course are you doing? I'm taking a BSc in Economics. OK, that's in the Faculty of Mathematics. Oh, I thought it was in the Faculty of Business and Management. It was last year, but the course has moved to the Mathematics Faculty this year. Oh, thanks for letting me know. No problem. Now, where are you going to be living? On campus or in private accommodation? University accommodation. I'm in room 112, Ashley Residence. Did you say Ashley Residence, the one in Duke Street? It's just that there's another residence called Askey Residence, so it's confusing sometimes. 
I don't want to make a mistake on the computer records, otherwise you won't receive any university mail. It's definitely Ashley. A-S-H-L-E-Y. Great. And what about your home address? On our records it says 56 Grove Street, Manchester, M19JA. Is that correct? Actually, there's a small mistake. It's M4, not M1. The rest is correct. 9JA. OK, I think that's all. You're enrolled on your course, so you can go and pay your fees now. Thanks. Bye. Track 32 Hi there, can I help you? Yes, I'd like to find out more information about the services here at the Students' Union. Of course, we're here to help you throughout your time at university. <laughs> so, what kind of help can you give me exactly? Well, our job focuses on three main areas. Giving advice and information to students, arranging social events and campaigning for students' rights. Right. And what about help with things relating to everyday life? Well, we have a team of six advisers who work part-time and have expertise in certain areas, including accommodation and travel. Oh, that's great. And how can I contact the advisers? Right. There are several ways. You can come into this office and speak to an advisor in person, or email us if you can't come in. And there's also a 24-hour helpline. You can find the helpline number on your student card. And you can call us at any time of day or night with any questions or worries you have. OK. And thanks for your help. You're welcome. Track 33 Hi. How can I help you? I'd like to register to use the library, please. OK, that's fine. Now, can I have some details from you? What's your name and student ID number? Simon Anderson. That's A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E the student says that his name is Simon Anderson, so the answer on the form is Anderson. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, how can I help you? I'd like to register to use the library, please. OK, that's fine. Now, can I have some details from you? What's your name and student ID number? Simon Anderson. That's A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And ID number? Uh, hold on. Let me look. It's A-N-D-105-763. A-N-D-105-769. No, it's A-N-D-105-763. Thank you. And what course are you studying, Simon? Geography. Is that in the Faculty of Environmental Science or Earth Science? It's in the Earth Science Faculty. Right. Now, are you living in university halls of residence? No, I'm in private accommodation. Do you need my address? Yes, please. It's flat 3, 24 Lavender Gardens, London, SW12 3AG. Can you spell the street name for me? Yes, it's L-A-V-E-N-D-E-R Gardens. And do you have a contact telephone number? Is my mobile number OK? Yes, that's fine. Just let me find my phone. Hmm. Uh, right, the number is 79 885 Let me just check that. 79 So, Simon, did you have a tour of the library facilities during your induction? Unfortunately, I missed it. Could you give me a quick tour now? Track 34 I can't give you a tour now, I'm afraid. I have to stay here at the help desk. But I can show you places on this map of the library. That would be helpful, thanks. OK, so we're here at the help desk, next to the service desk, where you go to borrow and return books. The maximum number of books you can borrow at any one time is ten. Yes, I see. 
Opposite the service desk is the training room, which is used by library staff to give demonstrations of the computer systems to staff and students. But the entrance is round the other side. Is the training room beside the quiet room? Yes, that's right. With the entrance round the front too. It's important to remember that all mobile phones must be switched off in this room. Of course. And what about books? Where can I find the books for my course? Good question. You're studying geography, so if you walk past the service desk, turn right. No, sorry. Turn left and continue on past the philosophy section. You'll find the geography section. The copying facilities are on the left. Now, one more important thing is the group study room and the booking system. If you're working on a project with other students and you want to discuss things with each other, you can go to the room in the corner at the opposite end of the library from the copiers. That's the group study room. It's between the sociology section and the TV room. The group study room must be booked forty-eight hours in advance. Right. Thanks.、Uh, can I keep this map? Actually, this is the last one I have, but I can make a copy for you. That would be great. Thanks. Oh, I should also explain how you book the group study room. Oh yes. So how do I do that? You can only book this room using the online reservation system, the same one you use to reserve books that are currently on loan. I thought it was called the online catalogue system. No, that's for searching for things in the library. The reservation system is what you use to make a room booking. And can I access that from outside the library? Yes, via the library website. You will need to enter the name and student number of each student in the group too. So make sure you have these to hand when you make the booking. But all this is explained on the home page of the website. Once you've made your reservation request, you'll receive a confirmation email from the library to say whether your booking has been successful or not. If not, you can try to arrange another time. Well, that sounds fairly easy. Yes, you'll be fine. It's all quite straightforward, really. Thanks. Track thirty-five. Now, not only do we have lots of historical architecture here in the town of Tanbridge, we also have a rich variety of famous residents. Of course, everyone has heard of the famous writers Jim Harman, Anna Collins, and Ian Cheriton, or I H Cheriton, as he is better known, and they have all lived in our small town. In fact. Anna Collins, the celebrated romance novelist, spent all her life in this town. She lived by the town square, where there is a plaque to commemorate her. She died in 1968, and you can see her gravestone in Tambridge Cemetery. You may know Anna from her most famous work, *The Pride of Angels*, which won numerous awards and for which she was a runner-up for the Herald Prize in 1950. James Harmon also lived here between 1975 and 1990. A best-selling horror writer, he got many of his themes for his haunting novels from this very town. He passed away a year after leaving Tanbridge, and although he isn't buried in the town, we do have a statue of him on the roundabout as you enter the town. Now, I. H. Cheriton has been the poet laureate for three years, and he lives in Tanbridge today. His home is the Red House by the river. Not only a poet, he has also written ten novels that have topped the book sales charts. He always does a lot of work for local charities and is quite a gem in this town. Lastly, another famous resident of Tanbridge is Sylvia Daniels. She grew up in Tanbridge and went to the local comprehensive here. You can see her childhood home just across the river by the post office. Now, I am sure you all know her for her latest film, Planet Dust, which has just reached number one at the cinema box office. But she wasn't always an actress. Before she headed for Hollywood, you could have seen her waiting tables in the Dorridge Restaurant here in town. She often comes back to visit, as her family all still live here. If you're lucky, you may even catch a glimpse of her. Track thirty-six. Welcome to the latest episode of Film Finest with me, Liz O'Donnell. The films I'll be reviewing in this episode are What Happens in the Night. The new horror film by acclaimed director Jan de Neiberg, and Happy as Larry, a new romance comedy starring Harrison Wyatt and Sonia Smith. Let's start with what happens in the night. Set in a convent school in the 1950s, 
This film tells the story of two boys who are haunted by apparitions of monks. The film has the feel of a comic book, as it's shot in black and white, with occasional shots of vivid color. Neberg, the director, said he wanted some elements to stand out, and he has used color to do it. I would say quite effectively. He claims his inspiration for the film is his own experiences growing up in 1950s Liverpool. A believer in ghosts himself, he thought he saw ghosts in his school years. Ghosts or not, this film is certainly haunting. What Happens in the Night is a film that will scare you. I wouldn't say it's the best horror film to come out this year, but it's certainly shot beautifully. And it's not hard to follow. So, unlike some recent horror films, you don't have to sit in dedicated concentration for two hours trying to keep up with a complex plot. An enjoyable film. I would give it four stars. In Happy as Larry, Sonia Smith and Harrison Wyatt play two people who fall in love but cannot be together because of their families. The build-up to the film has certainly been epic, with gossip about both co-stars in the papers. Rumor has it that Smith and Wyatt aren't the best of friends. In fact, on the set, they barely spoke to each other. I have to say, though, this doesn't come across in the film, and they look like a great couple. Happy as Larry is a move away from the usual films Sonia makes. She is better known for her roles in action films, but she has shown herself to be a capable comedy actress. However, I'm not sure this is the finest film to do it in. Both men and women alike can get something from this film, but the romance angle is overplayed and the laughs are few and far between. If you want romance, this film is fine, but if you want comedy, I would recommend seeing something else. I would give it three stars. Now, there are some new video releases which are going to be coming out in the next month. Track 37 So, we have Phyllis Bailey here to talk to us about fame. Her new book, Famous for 15 Minutes, is coming out on Monday. So, Phyllis, welcome. What do you think fame means to us these days? Well, famous people are everywhere. And although we know nearly all there is to know about these people, their lives are splashed all over magazines and television, they've retained their mystery. The public are always eager to find out more about them, and this fuels the paparazzi to photograph them. It's true that there are more celebrities around than ever before, but the number of really important famous people probably hasn't changed greatly. This is because people became famous for only a short time. Andy Warhol once famously said, In the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes, and I think there's some truth in that. One day a person is famous, and the next they are forgotten. Take, for example, contestants on reality television shows. After maybe six months, we never see them again. This also highlights another characteristic of fame. In the past, people became famous because of something they had done, or because of their talent. Nowadays, these things aren't necessary. I personally think this is a great pity. Is fame particularly beneficial now? Well, let's look at the winners and losers when it comes to fame. Many people think that celebrities are the losers in this new media world, but that isn't necessarily the case. Take, for example, actors and actresses. They often complain about a lack of privacy, but privacy is possible. There are many celebrities who aren't constantly in the papers. Much as they complain, they chase the publicity and then blame it on the media. In fact, the paparazzi, who photograph the rich and famous, are often seen as figures of hate for this. They come off much worse in the end because they are so disliked by the public and celebrities. But in reality, they are making the celebrities and their managers even richer. In fact, because of the cult of fame nowadays, we can see media executives making even more money and celebrities signing multi-million pound deals. And who pays for this? Well, all of us. Cinema and concert ticket prices have risen and DVDs cost more than ever. Merchandising makes a fortune for the famous these days. And although we are paying for it, the rewards go to only a small elite. The big players, the stars and the executives. But they miss a lot of the creative talent in the industry. 
like the people who write the screenplays. They are still on the same salary they were on ten years ago. Executives certainly have a difficult job managing their clients, but they get rewarded well for doing so. I, for one, think these rewards should be more fairly spread. How could this be done? Are you suggesting? Track thirty-eight. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Thank you for coming along to the Cultural Sydney Talk. I'm going to start by telling you about the Yellow Plaque Scheme, which has been running in Sydney for over forty years and has been incredibly successful. When you're walking around the city, you'll see some buildings with a small round yellow plaque on them. If you take a closer look, you'll see the name and details of a famous person who lived in that very place. We have at present 130 plaques up in the city. The scheme has been great for tourism, but it was really started to raise awareness of the rich history of Sydney, both locally and nationally. And we think we've managed to do this. We also wanted to make people aware of the impressive list of important people who have lived in this city, and we've certainly achieved that. But that's not all. Although not part of our original aims, the scheme. Has also helped preserve some of the older and more important buildings in Sydney, because people now know that these buildings are a link to our past. Some of the buildings are actually over 180 years old, which for Australia is ancient. We actually think that this is where the scheme has achieved the most success in raising the profile of our rich history. Of course, it has helped tourism, but not only that. Locals also walk around looking at the plaques. It has been really wonderful in highlighting our past. Some people are quite surprised to see who has lived here. Take Errol Flynn, for example. He was married in Sydney. We are planning on putting more plaques up, and a common question is how can people nominate a figure to be put on a plaque? It's quite a simple process. Applications can be downloaded from our website. If you want to nominate someone for a plaque, you just need the person's name, where they lived, and you need three signatures to approve your application. Our panel then checks that all the data you've submitted is correct, and hopefully, within a year, a new plaque will be erected. But you can't nominate just anyone. A plaque can only be given to a person who is famous and has achieved something out of the ordinary, like an important politician or world record-breaking sportsman, for example. We aim to have fifty new plaques up within the next three years, and we have plenty of funding to do so. Our funding comes from three sources: the local council, community donations, and the tourist board. Whereas in the past the tourist board put in the majority of funding, now public donations count for sixty-five percent of all total funds. In fact, our funding is so healthy now there are plans to expand the scheme. Track thirty-nine. At the moment, we only have yellow plaques for all the famous people, but we are aiming to produce different coloured plaques so that people can do specific walks. For example, if they are interested in famous sports personalities, they can do a tour following the red plaques, the colour we are aiming to use for these people. We are looking at introducing grey, white, and green plaques as well. We are thinking of using grey plaques to signify people who have done important work within the government. And white plaques for those who have done good works in the community. Lastly, our green plaques we think will be very popular. These will be for painters and sculptors, leaving our yellow ones for writers, actors, and other people of note. We do hope you enjoy looking at the plaques around the city. We have guidebooks on sale in the gift shop where you can find all the plaques. These are priced at eleven dollars ninety nine. CD two. Track one. Hi, James. How's your alternative energy research project going? To be honest, I'm a bit confused about how to do the research for all the different energy types. Well, the first thing you do is to make sure you focus your question. Otherwise, you'll have too much to read, and you won't be able to select the key arguments. So, how do I do that? Start with the general topic of alternative energy, and then keep asking questions until you've narrowed the topic down to one particular area. Then, when you have your question, make a list of the reading you will need. 
This list should be general to give you some background, but remember you'll need to focus on the issues related to the question, so the reading list should also be specific to the actual energy source you've chosen, whether it's wind or solar or wave power. And then start reading. Absolutely. You need to start straight away, but don't forget to make notes as you read. Otherwise, you won't be able to keep track of ideas for future reference purposes. Yes, that makes sense. I think that's my main problem. I don't recall where I've read different ideas, so I can't find them again later. And my friends have warned me that not recording ideas in a system can really hinder your progress. Your friends are right. It's a common problem amongst students. You need a system. Anyway, once you've done the reading and made all your notes, you need to organise them so that you can analyse and think about what you've read. But I prefer to just start writing and then go back and look at my notes later. Hmm, I wouldn't recommend it. I think you need to give yourself more time to digest the material and arrange it into some kind of system ready for analysis in terms of relevance to your research question. Well, that's a great help. Thank you, Professor Jenkins. You're welcome. Come and see me again if you have any more problems. Track 2 Hi Mary, how are you? I'm fine, thanks John. How is your essay going? Not so good actually. Would you be able to help me with it? Of course. What do you want to know? Well, just the type of information you're going to write about. I won't copy you. I just want some ideas to get me started. Well, Mr Jones advised us to focus on just two or three forms of non-traditional energy for our evaluation. So, I think I'm going to choose solar. It's fairly easy to evaluate. Are you going to explain both the positive and negative aspects? Well, Mr Jones warned us not to get too involved in the ethical aspects of the topic. So, I'm going to structure my essay by using the advantages and disadvantages of each energy form. That's why I also want to talk about biofuels. I think there are more disadvantages. Oh, I see what you're doing. Using the negative points of one to highlight the positive points of the other. That's a smart idea. And what about the third energy source? Hmm, I was having difficulty choosing between nuclear and wind because they're both problematic, but I've decided to do nuclear for my presentation instead. Thanks, Mary. Chatting to you has helped me think a bit more clearly about my essay. That's fine. Good luck with it. Track 3 Hi there, guys. Nice to see you. And you. So... Are we going to finalise what we're doing for the environmental science presentation today? I hope so. The presentation is next week. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about this, because I think we need to take out some of the information we're including. Oh, really? Like what, Shirley? Well, I'd like to suggest taking out the background details. I think it's just too much information to fit into ten minutes. But isn't it important to make sure the audience understands the context? I don't think so. And, and anyway, we could include the background details on the handout. OK, I'm with you on that. Chris, what do you think? Yes, OK, that's fine. I'll add the details to the handout. Anything else? Yes. I'm not sure whether the solar energy statistics will be too much for the audience to take in. There's a lot of numbers and graphs. Can we put the statistics on a handout too? Hmm, I see your point. We don't want people looking at lots of numbers while we're speaking. But without the statistics, I don't see how we can support our main ideas. Actually, you're right, Tom. I hadn't thought about that. In that case, can we delete the diagrams? It's going to take too much time to explain them. Hmm, let's think about that a bit more. If we have to choose between taking out the statistics or the diagrams... I think we should opt for the diagrams. They're less crucial to the presentation. What do you both think? I think it's going to work much better than the original plan we had. Absolutely. We won't have to worry about talking for longer than 15 minutes if we remove the diagrams and focus on the main ideas and statistics. Shall we all meet again tomorrow to finalise the details? Track 4 Hi everyone. Sorry I'm late. Don't worry, Hannah. We've only just started. We thought we should go over the theories we've studied so far, so we're ready for the seminar discussion on Thursday afternoon. Of course, you're right. I don't think I can remember all the theories related to consumer energy consumption. 
No, Hannah, that's the reading for Friday's lecture. Thursday's seminar discussion is about the current thinking on alternative energy. Oh, yes. Sorry, I'm a bit disorganised at the moment. Never mind. So, Mike, what do you think about the academics' point of view on nuclear energy? Well, I think I have to agree with them on price being a factor for choosing nuclear in the long term. Me too. It's definitely the most cost-effective measure. Don't you agree, Hannah? To start with, I didn't, but the text Professor Edwards gave us persuaded me. The only thing that concerns me is that there have been some disasters in various parts of the world. Yes, some texts warn of the dangers of nuclear power, using previous disasters as examples. I know what you mean, but I suppose the risk is minimal these days. What do you think about wind and solar energy in terms of the price in relation to the advantages? For me, they're just not worth it. Both are expensive, and it's difficult to predict the amount of energy each one will produce. You know, Mike, I'm afraid I don't share your opinion. This text here talks about the likelihood of improved technology, increasing the amount of energy and reducing the costs in the future. Yes, but that's not enough proof to be sure of the relationship between the costs and the benefits. Exactly. The evidence seems incomplete to me. Well, that's something we can follow up on with the rest of the group in the seminar on Thursday. Track 5 Good morning, Phil. Jackie, I hope your project is going well. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Hi, Mr. Jackson. Well, we've made a start on analysing the different forms of renewable energy, but unfortunately, we don't really agree on some points. OK, why don't we talk about it? Well, Jackie believes that all forms of renewable energy are beneficial economically, whereas I doubt that that's true for all of them. Such as? Such as wind, wave and solar energy, because they're less reliable. That's a valid point, but I don't think that's a large enough factor to disregard it completely. Exactly. That's what I said. However, another drawback is that they're generally very expensive to produce. Yes, you're right. And that is a concern when evaluating their usefulness in future. I agree with you to a point, but it's likely that the cost will come down. I read a report in the Journal of Environmental Science that estimates the cost would fall by 20% over the next 10 years, which is significant, isn't it? Absolutely, Jackie. But you need to think about how difficult it is to predict the future cost of non-traditional energy sources before you believe the report. Remember... In your project, I want to see evidence of critical analysis. Make sure you've analysed all the information, rather than just accepting the information that you agree with. Also, it's very important that you demonstrate wide reading around the subject. I know. It's just that I'm not convinced that it's going to continue to be that expensive, especially if there's a demand from consumers. Well, what about if we analyse the costing process as part of our project? That's an excellent idea, Phil. OK, so let's imagine that we want to forecast the cost of producing solar energy. How could we do that, Jackie? Mm, well, I think we'd have to start by working out how many hours of daylight there are in the UK per year. The meteorological office would have data on that. Then estimate the number of hours of sun to get a rough total. And then I suppose we'd need to work out how much it would cost to supply the average home with solar power and then extrapolate that to get a number for the whole country. Good. And don't forget the price of power conversion stations. This will have a significant impact on overall expenditure. And there's one more factor you haven't taken into account yet regarding the consumers. Um, whether they would change from traditional to renewable energy? No, but think about what might make them change. Oh, yes. How much they would be willing to pay. Exactly. Well done. Track 6. So, our project is going to cover three main areas. Firstly, comparing the main forms of alternative energy, solar, wind, wave, and biofuels in terms of production costs. Secondly, We'll take solar energy as an example and do a cost prediction. And lastly, we'll analyse whether they're likely to replace traditional fossil fuels in the future. That sounds like a comprehensive project with a good focus. Now, what data are you going to use and what approach will you use for the analysis? 
Ah, now that's something we do agree on. We want to use the reports you gave us in our last lecture and some statistics from the Government, Environment and Energy Department. In terms of analysis, we're going to use a cross-referencing method where we compare each of the government reports with the Robertson report and highlight any differences. Then we'll analyze these to see why the differences exist and where more research needs to be done. Track 7 OK, so to finish, I want to look at the resources available for researching UK census information for the essay you'll be writing at the end of this module. There are many resources for the study of the civilian population and family history out there, ranging from public to academic to commercial. Some are available for the public to access free of charge, whilst others are only available by payment of fees or restricted to academics and subject to registration. Some are more appropriate to family or genealogical investigation, others to historical population research. So, if we start at the beginning of the list on your handout, you'll see, firstly, there is the Family Records Centre based in central London. The centre and their website are available to anyone in the country who has an interest in researching demographic data. Their work might be useful to give you an overview of the general sorts of data and services available – Unfortunately, you do have to pay a registration charge of £20 for a year's access to their material. The next resource on the list is Genes Reunited, which is mainly for people who want to find out more about their ancestors. There are some good interactive tools on this website, especially the one which shows you how to manipulate the National Census Association's statistical data – Although Genes Reunited is very useful, it is used by a range of businesses and therefore accessing the site will cost you. Now, the third item on the handout is the National Census Association, which contains the most up-to-date data as it's compiled from official government census data every 10 years. Both companies and individuals are able to access all their resources without payment, so this may be a good place to start your research. Finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to two journals at the bottom of the handout. The first one, Journal of Historical Migration, is not actually a journal, but a collection of articles on a website. Anyway, you might like to take a look at it because it has several articles on the importance of recording census data from a historical research perspective. This site is available to the general public, so you don't have to pay or register. The other one, the Journal of Social Demography, is only available using your university online journal's login details, as it can only be accessed by those studying or researching in higher education. Right, well, that should be enough reading for you. Track 8 Today, I'd like to continue from last week's lecture by looking at what helps people successfully integrate into a new culture. Whereas the reasons for migration are nowadays fairly easy to identify and largely related to employment opportunities or political instability, the factors behind being able to adapt to the new culture and create a new life are considerably more complex. Let's start with an overview of the issues as shown on this diagram. Starting on the left of the diagram, there are two lists of factors, internal and external. It's important to notice that the internal factors, in other words, those based on an individual's personality, are divided into positive factors – trusting others and acknowledging that people are different, and negative, being afraid and being suspicious of people. You might think that the list of negative factors would include discrimination, but it doesn't because discrimination comes under the larger category of fear. Now, what you should also notice is that the external factors are not labelled in this way. It's much more difficult to know how to measure the effects of external factors and whether they actually are external or not. The influence of family relationships, climate, beliefs and values, and the ability to communicate in the language of the new culture have wide-ranging effects which are difficult to measure and can distort any research. 
Now focus on the centre of the diagram, and you'll see this phrase, coping strategies. This is important because studies have shown that people who integrate well into a new culture, and that is any culture, by the way, are those who have eradicated any negativity and made positive choices and adopted coping strategies such as observing people and taking time to listen and ask questions in order to diminish the effects of culture shock. What we have observed is that people who demonstrate positive coping strategies, such as observing, listening and questioning, end up by understanding the host culture better and integrating quicker and more successfully. However, those who choose to be critical of the differences and therefore react negatively to the host culture are likely to have increased feelings of alienation. This alienation can tail off and become the beginning of acceptance if a person has some positive experiences, but it usually deteriorates quickly into isolation. Track 9 Many people have immigrated to Britain and become citizens over the last 200 years, and in today's lecture, I'd like to look at the various laws or Acts of Parliament introduced to deal with those people who came to live in Britain. In 1793, there was the Aliens Act, which the British government introduced to control the number of refugees fleeing to Britain to escape the revolution in France. Compared to today, when refugees have to complete a long and complicated application process before arrival, in 1793, all that was required by the authorities was that individuals had to register at the port where they arrived. The collection of personal information started in 1844 with the Naturalisation Act, which was updated in 1870. The main difference in the 1870 Act was that applicants who wanted to stay in Britain had to have served the Crown or to have lived in the country for at least five years before being considered. Both these Acts allowed the government to control the number of people coming into the country. These changes were fairly insignificant regarding people's freedoms and the amount of state intervention involved. However, in the 20th century, this began to change. The Alien Registration Act was introduced in 1914, and when the First World War broke out, all aliens over the age of 16 had to register at local police stations, be of good character and demonstrate a working knowledge of English. The reason for this act was to create a feeling of patriotism among migrant communities and also to stop spies from Europe infiltrating the country. And after the Second World War, the meaning of British nationality was redefined again, this time to encourage residents from British colonies to come to Britain to help rebuild the country. This was the British Nationality Act of 1948. The condition was that potential migrants had to demonstrate that they wanted to work and were fit and healthy. Finally, there was the Commonwealth Immigration Act of 1962. Legislation was passed to restrict the number of Commonwealth immigrants to Britain. Although many people still wanted to come to Britain to obtain good jobs, the Act now meant applicants had to get work permits, which were given mostly to skilled immigrants such as doctors. In the next session, I want to look at more contemporary Acts. For instance, the one that was... Track 10. This morning, I'd like to focus on New York as a model for understanding immigration patterns in relation to national rather than international change. Firstly, it is important to understand that migration patterns are primarily affected by the rules of immigration which determine the conditions of entry. After that, internal changes can affect patterns considerably. To highlight my first point, let's study this diagram of Ellis Island and the process of admitting immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Upon arrival at Ellis Island, people underwent a series of examinations and questions before being allowed to enter the US. First of all, there was a medical inspection to ensure the immigrants were not bringing in any contagious diseases. Anyone who did not pass the medical examination was refused entry to New York and sent home on the next available ship. 
If the examination was passed, immigrants were required to take a further examination, this time a legal examination to establish whether they had any criminal convictions. After this, immigrants were able to change currency and purchase tickets for onward rail travel from New York. Having completed this simple process, immigrants were told to wait. This wait could be as long as five hours before boarding a ferry to take them to New York City. This simple system allowed millions of immigrants to enter the US and is largely responsible for the ethnic makeup of the city today. Even though the immigrants themselves may have had a variety of reasons for deciding to migrate, it was only possible because of US national immigration laws. Moving on to the second point, how changes within a country can have as much or more of an effect than those outside the country, various parts of New York have changed radically in their ethnic makeup over the last 200 years. Communities became wealthier, governments introduced new laws, and employment opportunities came and went. These factors affect where people choose to live or force them to move to somewhere different. For example, most people think that the population has changed in Manhattan due to the rise of its importance as a financial trade centre, which is true to some extent. But like the Ellis Island example, a change in politics, namely a change of mayor, allowed the city to boom as a financial centre, and this resulted in different types of people moving to the area. Brooklyn is an interesting example too, and we'll be looking at it as our case study later in the lecture. Whereas it used to be a predominantly working-class area of the city and therefore attracted unskilled migrant workers, nowadays its fame as a centre for up-and-coming artists and musicians means it has attracted a new and much more diverse population of middle-class residents. Finally, Queens has shown a dramatic change in its population over the last 50 years due to the airports there. This means that the number of airline staff living in the area has dramatically increased and changed the nature of the local population. Finally, I'd like to use Brooklyn as a case study of local change. Brooklyn's population has changed significantly over the years, and this can most easily be seen in its economic activity. Tracing the Brooklyn industries back from the current financial services companies to manufacturing in the 1950s to shipbuilding in the 1900s, we can map this onto average wages and therefore the type and class of resident. And this has affected the population density too, which has been steadily increasing over the past 100 years from 1.5 million in 1900 through to 2 million in the middle of the 20th century to the 2.3 million inhabitants today. In fact, Brooklyn is suffering from considerable overpopulation now. But this large population increase was due not to employment, but the building of the subway, which linked Brooklyn to other areas of New York. Prior to this, at the beginning of the 20th century, the only way of transportation was the Brooklyn Bridge. Another factor which traditionally increases the desire for the middle classes to live in a particular place is the extent and type of local heritage, especially for those people with young children. In Brooklyn, this is evident in the increase in population after the construction of Coney Island. The modern-day equivalent of this is the restoration of Prospect Park, which has brought more middle-income families into the area. Track 11 Excuse me, where can I fill up my water bottle? There's a water cooler just inside the main doors. Is this your first time here? Yes, I just had my induction last week. I'm Anna. Hi, I'm John. If you have any problems and I'm around, please just ask. Have you been coming here long? Yes, I've lived here all my life, just a couple of miles away. I started coming here when I was just a kid. I suppose I'm quite a faithful member. My brother and father come here too. Wow, that's impressive. Thanks. I enjoy it so much because it basically gives me so much energy for the day. It's unusual that I'm here at this time. I work pretty hard, and so I try to fit it in before work usually. I start work at 7, so I usually get in here by about 5.30. Oh, it must still be dark at that time. Yes, it is. That must take some willpower. It does, but it's worth it. You should try an early session. It really makes you feel good about the day. How often are you planning on coming? I was thinking maybe just twice a week at the beginning and, and then build up from there. What do you think? That's a good idea. When are you thinking of coming? Probably evenings. Is it generally very busy then? It can be. 
I came in the evening yesterday and it was quite busy. In fact, a funny thing happened. I was on the treadmill and suddenly water started hitting me. It was the fire alarm. The sprinklers had gone off. I was absolutely soaked. It was the first time anything like that has happened, but it was pretty funny. Fortunately, it was a false alarm. (laughs) So much excitement at the gym. I think I'm going to enjoy this. Track 12 Thank you for taking the time to see me today, Mr Jones. I'd just like to take a minute to outline our new step machines. No problem. I'm interested in getting a few. We don't have any in the gym yet. That's great. Well, let me talk you through the build of the step machine. If you have a look at the sales brochure, you can see what they look like on page 14. OK. These machines are two metres tall, so they tend to stand out. The tallest part is the holding frame. At the top there, we have the main grips. These grips, when they are held, monitor heart rate so that the user can check they are working out at their optimum heart rate. That's great. And where does this rate show up? They'll be able to see it on the screen below. This screen is fully digital and shows not only their heart rate, but the number of steps they've taken and the distance they've travelled. On the panel there, they also have a selection of workouts. They can set it by distance or time or by the amount of calories they want to burn. They can even set it to climb a famous mountain or hill or walk up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, for example. (laughs) That's great. I like those more fun settings. And the great thing is you can have people climbing up Mount Everest, for example, every day for 10 years and this machine will still be in perfect working order. It's made to last. It not only has a metallic spine, but durable pedals made from the most high-tech materials on the market. And the machine works via a wheel in the centre. That's unusual, isn't it? Yes, it is. But we find a central wheel lasts much longer than a pump system. The central wheel is attached to a bracket, which ensures each step movement is as smooth as the last. Uh, The final feature I should point out to you is the side supports, which ensure safety for all machine users. If users feel tired, they can hold on to these and slow down their stepping. I see. Well, I think I might take three of them. Track 13 OK, Alice, I just need a few more details to start your membership. Your full name is Alice Wilson, yes? No, Watson. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Which age range are you? Well, I'm just out of the 16 to 25 bracket. I'm 26 now. Great. 26 to 35? Yes. And do you have any health problems which may affect your exercise? No, I don't have any health conditions. I'll put none. Do you do any exercise at the moment? Not much. I exercise a couple of times a week. And what do you do? Well, I used to play tennis, but I stopped. Now I only go swimming. OK. And why have you decided to join up? Just to improve my fitness. I don't want to lose any weight or build muscles or anything. Fine. Well, I would recommend doing the Level 2 workout programme to begin with. It takes about 40 minutes to do the whole programme. I'll get you an information sheet so you can see what it involves. Track 14 Hi, Penny. How are you doing? Have you just been to the gym? Hi, Debbie. I'm good, thanks. Yes, I've just finished a workout. How are you? Yes, good. I'm planning on going to the gym later, but it's hard finding the time now I've got a child. (laughs) I bet it is. Have you tried any of their new exercise classes? Yes, I tried some last week. I wanted to go to yoga, but it was full up. I went to the dance class instead. It was really fun. Oh, and kickboxing last Thursday too. (laughs) That was exhausting. Well, you didn't miss much at yoga. I went there last Friday and it was far too hard. I couldn't do most of the exercises. Oh, no. Are you going to try anything else? Well, I was thinking of trying the aerobics class. My friend did that one and said the instructor was awful. Well, I'll probably give it a miss then. I've got to go to a conference next week anyway, so I'll be away from Tuesday to Friday. Oh, lucky you.